All right. Uh, welcome to the Ordinance Committee meeting of August 20th, 2020. Um, if uh, I will take roll call. Uh, I know uh, Liam Gallagher is here, Assistant Town Manager, Jay Chase, the Planner, Chris St. Pierre, who's a special guest. He's been an intern um, for us in Scarborough this year, this summer. I appreciate that. Tracy Cole is admin, and then the official attendance, uh, Councillor Hamill. Here. Councillor Johnson. Here. And then myself, uh, Councillor Katarina. Um, if we could just look very quickly at, um, Jean Marie needs to look at it, in other words. Oh, we have minutes from July 9th, 2020. Any uh, comments or changes? Nope. My nope. two fellow members, no. Okay, could I have a motion to approve? So moved. I second. <laughs> All in favor? Oh, we got to do the roll call. I always forget this on Zoom. Mr. Hamill? Aye. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Ms. Katarina is an aye. Um, do we have any members of the public who would like to speak? I uh, set aside uh, a maximum of 15 minutes at the beginning um, of the meeting. It's three minute um, limitation on comments. So raise your hand. I noticed uh, Rocky, you're out there. Uh, and I don't know if there's anyone else. Liam, do you see anyone else? Just, uh, just the town managers in, in attendance, but. And I don't see any hands up. Okay. Going once, going twice. Okay, that's it. We're going to move forward then. So let's get into a discussion of uh, growth management. This is a follow up. Um, we had sent, um, oh, I guess, how do I want to put it? Um, walking orders to the Long Range Planning Committee, uh, asking them to take a look at this because technically under the charter, they're in charge of growth. And they did. They had a couple of meetings over the summer um, and came up with some findings. Um, and also in addition to that, Mr. St. Pierre, <clears throat> who, Chris, do you mind just telling us who you are and, and what your job has been this summer? So sure. the public will know. Yes, uh, I'm taking. I'm a student or a grad student at the Muskie School at USM, and it's my first semester. I'm taking a course on local government with uh, <laughs> uh, Professor Carolyn Ball. Huh? Uh, she kind of set up my or, uh, internship with Larissa. I started with her, and so I'm here to uh, do a project for the town of Scarborough. And the project was, or has been. I was asked to look at uh, a few different things, uh, the growth management growth. ordinance, uh, a look at any kind of current building trends uh, and data that affect growth management and the town's beach pass, uh, uh, beach season pass analysis and also the parking analysis at the uh, Scarborough Land Trust conservation sites. Okay. Great. Uh, th thank you for that. So Chris did a, a, a paper that um, the members of this committee uh, should have gotten an email this morning on that. Jay, would you talk to us a, a, just a little bit about um, you got the email and, and how do we want to do the, I'm, I'm going to defer to Jay. I hope you guys don't mind. Um, do we want to do the long range planning piece first or Chris's piece first? It doesn't matter to me. So I initially heard a question um, so, uh, to me anyway, and then I'll defer as to how you wish to proceed. But um, so as it's already mentioned, you know, um, Chris, Larissa, as she has the last couple of summers, has done a really nice job of um, communicating with the Muskie School and finding some really good interns for the community. And uh, when she's, you know, as she typically does, she asks around to different departments about what type of projects are going on that we might use some help on. And that was around the time where we started this discussion around the growth management ordinance and starting to look at, well, what type of information might help to inform ongoing discussions. 
And I think you'll see as we talk about the sort of the five questions that were posed to the long range planning committee from the ordinance committee, um, there's sort of a number of analysis points, data sets that they think will help inform an ongoing discussion. Um, they weren't really prepared to provide any strong recommendations on a couple of things because they felt like they needed more information. And that's where um, we sort of said, well, let's see what, what type of uh, nice work we can get out of an intern to start to inform that discussion. And so maybe my thought might be to have Chris maybe present, uh, again, we're right now he's uh, got some draft findings. I think maybe just a little bit of refinement as we go forward, but some really good work. Um, and I know uh, the internship ends, I believe, August 30th. And one of the, one of the pieces to the internship was to um, ensure that there was a presentation of the materials to a, a body of the, of the town. And this seemed like a really good opportunity to do that because this is what we're talking about. So uh, maybe Chris could start with you know, providing his updates. Yeah, we saw uh, Chris provide his, uh, his draft to me yesterday afternoon. Um, so I've had a chance to give it a cursory review, and, and I, I know Karen Martin has spent some time looking as well, and I uh, was glad we were able to get that out to you this morning. Um, sorry it was this morning, but, you know, again, we're, I think the expectation is this is the start of the conversation, um, and if I'm off base, I'm sorry about that, but the, this is the start of the conversation. Chris will probably put some finishing touches on that report, which we'll provide to the committee in the next, you know, week or two. Um, once it's finalized and you'll have that with more time to review and, and we'll put that out as a more public document than the draft at this point. So, uh, okay. Does that make sense to you guys, Dawn and, and Ken, to start with Chris's presentation? Is that all right? Absolutely. Okay. All right. So with no, no further ado, uh, Chris, you ready, you. To, ready to roll? I'm ready. Okay. So I'm just going to run through this and uh, just kind of read off some of some of the findings that I came up with. Uh, Can you hold on one second, Chris? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Liam, do you have a copy of that? By any chance that report that you can put up? Liam, if you can't find it, I maybe I'll find it. Um, I love technology when I get it to work right. I have it pulled up if you want me to share, Liam. There it is. I've got, I, yep. I see it. I see it. Do you guys see it? I've got split screen. Yes. Here. Okay. Yes. Okay, cool. Hopefully this will be helpful for you, Chris, to have it up also. Sure, because I'm just going to kind of sure. touch base and run through it and we'll yep. you know, pick okay. out some highlights and all right all right sorry go ahead the floor is yours no worries um so i was just like i said this is a, a preliminary finding so far um introduction just has uh some statistics about uh the town of scarborough and what's happened uh, it has a uh, numbers of the july 1st 2019 uh and some housing numbers um i jumped to uh single family growth trends um i was Looking at an article, uh, it was in actually January uh, of this year, uh, Mortgage Daily News, in which the author um, charts the decline in the size of new single home family homes mm -hmm. uh, in the last 20 years. So it's kind of been uh, typical after an economic downturn, and it, it's actually uh, in New England, it's declined a number of four bedroom homes and the shift to smaller homes. So we're actually below. Uh, you know, the, the uh, national average were actually, you know, contracting in size in, in New England. Um, so one of the trends that uh, developers have had to contend with is the shift in housing needs uh, between baby boomers and millennials. Uh, so as uh, baby boomers are starting to uh, move into other type of housing, including smaller, like, you know, branches like my parents just did, um, I sold them a house in, in Scarborough, actually, in Lane Farms. Um, and they're also moving towards, you know, condos, uh, multi-units, and assisted living and nursing homes. Uh, and to take the place of, uh, take the place of uh, the, uh, you know, seniors moving into other uh, accommodations, you have millennials, uh, and young, older millennials are looking to actually take over the 
um, the single family, you know, suburban homes and younger millennials are looking for more uh, uh, smaller accommodations and densely populated areas, walkable uh, uh, multifamily uh, homes. Um, and as for multifamily growth trends, uh, I looked at a report from the Joint Center for Housing Studies at Harvard and the author Hannah Ho Hoyt uh, discusses the obstacles in providing affordable multifamily housing from labor and skilled craftspeople shortages to high land acquisition costs and building material cost increases, which all have contributed to lack of uh, affordable housing being built. Um, then I kind of touch on the senior citizens a little bit more. Uh, in 2019, uh, there's an article in Maine Biz in which uh, the author uh, includes a statistic that the state of Maine leads the nation in the median age of 43.8 years old. And I found another statistic in which uh, the Scarborough's, uh, Scarborough's median age in 2019 was 47.1 years of age. So uh, Scarborough exceeds the state median age. Um, Maine is poised to lead the nation in the number of 65 or older residents as a percentage of the population, with estimates for 2020 to be 22%, as compared to New England's percentage of 18%, and the national average of 17%. In 2040, the numbers jump uh, pretty sharply, and 29% uh, for the state of Maine, 23% for New England, and 20% nationally. Hey, Chris, can I just uh, stop for a second? Um, yeah. Don, put your hand up. Did you want to? Yeah. Yeah, I had a question. I just wanted to ask if you <clears throat> want to take questions as you go, or should we hold them toward the end? Because, you know, I, um, you know, I want to just ask how you prefer to do that, uh, Chris and, uh, and Jean Marie. Uh, I can do either. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, Chris, if you don't mind taking them as we go. Sure. We can... uh, I know some people that disrupts their flow and they don't like that. And others, I apologize, Dawn. I was trying to find where we were and didn't see No trouble. Anything. Thank you, Liam, no for catching that. So if that, yep, Chris, if you're okay, I did want to ask you one quick question there. You said the New England trends are more pronounced than the national trends uh, on some of the early points you made. Do you have any idea for what the re what is the explanation for that? Is it a demographic? Uh, is it a housing mix issue, or is there is it not known? It's it's a little bit of each. I mean, Maine has the oldest housing stock in the country, and mm -hmm. and just older demographics. So I mean, it's it's you know, it's going to be a significant issue. You know, it's already starting to be, but in the next uh, you know twenty years, it's going to you know get increasingly. Uh, more significant. That's great. Thanks. I didn't know that. That's a new factoid for Maine. You know, oldest median age, oldest housing stock. <laughs> yes. Thanks. I, I'm sitting in a house that's a hundred and something years old. So there you go. And I'm getting old. I turned 65 <laughs> yesterday. So there you go. All right. I live, on, I live in Portland. My house is 200 years old. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I don't know how, but it's still here. Survived the fire. <laughs> so thank you. Yes, no problem. I'm happy to just jump in and you know ask any questions you need to Great. ask. Um, but as a secondary segment of the population that's been impacted by uh, the high costs of housing has been, it's kind of uh, been identified as a missing middle. And it mm -hmm. kind of has two connotations. Uh, it actually has to deal with um, not only the, uh, it's the type of housing like in between single family you know, in suburbs and you know the uh, in, in, like a town center type. So it, it's kind of an infill housing of multi units and clustered housing types. Um, and it also has to uh, refer to um, kind of like the missing middle class, which has been in decline in the last, you know, 20, 30 years uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, and I was looking at the National Multifamily Housing Council who had a fact sheet uh, and said that over one third of American households pay more than 30% of their income on housing. And that was in 2017. And it's been getting worse in, in all over Maine and across the country. Um, you know, Portland's been very difficult. I know, uh, you know, in my um, neighborhood and where I live. 
Um, then I jumped down to, uh, there was a study by the National Association of Home Builders in 2019. And uh, there was a, a webinar by uh, Dan Paralek, who's of Opticos Design. Um, during his webinar, he stated that 59% of millennials are looking for missing middle housing for the uh, in the for sale and rental markets versus 39% who are looking for single family homes. So this is kind of an interesting statistic where you have, um, it may be a, a good way to focus on uh, or a draw to attract millennials to uh, work and live in town and keeping some of this, uh, uh, you know, the young professionals here and kind of avoid the brain drain, which has been going on in Maine for a number of years. Um, then I jumped down to the growth management ordinance review. Uh, I looked at several towns, you know, there, there are uh, several uh, who do have a, a growth management ordinance. Um, and so the ones I kind of looked at was Falmouth, Limington, Elliott, Waterboro, Arundel. And interestingly enough, uh, the town of Wyndham has just passed as of uh, the end of last month. It goes into effect uh, next week. Uh, their growth management ordinance, which is pretty similar to Scarborough's. So I think Scarborough's led the way in you know, creating a comprehensive growth management ordinance and uh, other communities are now looking to uh, kind of model theirs after uh, Scarborough's. Uh, I kind of lay out the kind of the, the differences and what they do. Um, they use for uh, growth permits, each residential unit requires one growth permit, whether it's a two family or a multifamily, they require one. Um, and they don't use the fractionalized system that uh, that Scarborough does. I haven't found any any towns or uh, you know jurisdictions who actually have used a fractional uh, you know based system for uh, growth permits for multifamilies. Um, uh, Waterboro, same thing. They uh, and also Falmouth. Uh, there's no reserve pool, which uh, Scarborough has. Uh, Wyndham did uh, include. Uh, a reserve pool, I believe. Yes, they do. And mm -hmm. uh, they also require 10% of those permits to be uh, set aside for affordable housing if the uh, reserve pool is increased. Um, let's see. Next, uh, I moved down to the uh, Scarborough ordinance. And when, when you determined or you know, came up with uh, uh, the fractionalized growth permit uh, uh, process and the information that they used in 2008 to, you know, look at and uh, come up with those uh, uh, provisions was sewage load, number of occupants per unit, and average vehicle trips. And I include those, you know, in the report. I have not seen any updates. I was looking, trying to find, you know, see if there's any updates. Um, but I don't see any that I could come across in my research. Chris, uh, Don has a question. Sure. Yeah, thank, thanks, Liam. Uh, Chris, I was going to ask you again, not to, uh, you know, monopolize the airwaves, but I was kind of curious, uh, in, in your study of looking at the other towns, GMOs, I'm, I was curious in particular, uh, you know, did you, did you notice was there was any particular thing that they may have done uh, suddenly to try to, you know, get, get control of their growth? You know, I, for example, and I'm, let's use the moratoriums, for example. You know, I, I understand Falmouth did one recently. Were you able to get any insights on that? Uh, and I know in our discussions with the Long Range Planning Committee, uh, you know, most folks feel that's a pretty, you know, uh, a pretty crude uh, tool and uh, and one that's, you know, easy to put in place, but hard to, you know, hard to manage. Uh, did you have any, you know, I know that's a real specific question. Do you have any kind of insights on that, the use of a moratorium? Um, by have, other towns, I have not come across a moratorium in any any of these jurisdictions. I have you okay. know, research articles. Um, and, and I, I I, sorry, um, I can tell you, Don and Jay, you can correct me if I'm wrong. But state the state has an overarching statute to do with growth management, and I do believe that um, moratoriums are you have to. It's very specific use of them. Um, and they're very limited um, by state statute. 
So, yeah, you don't see that a lot. I mean, you got to have a damn good reason for doing it, I guess is where I'm going with that. Um, in other words, you got a runaway train for some reason. Um, and I think, uh, and again, I, I'm digging deep here and I wasn't on the council and I wasn't all that involved. I wasn't in real estate yet at the time, but um, part of Sc Scarborough's development of, of this growth management I think we did a moratorium briefly to put this in place, um, but that was then and this is now. So just Great. just that's my, what I know, the background of moratoriums for Thank you. Uh, uh, towns. Am I right, Jay, on the state statute? Yep, and actually um, we could talk a little bit more about that. It, I, I did put the, some of the state statute language in the oh, okay. memo that I provided. Um, yeah. And so there's really sort of two stipulations. We can take a look at those, but um, when we get there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Ken, Ken, you have a question? Yeah, I'm just wondering in, in your research of the other uh, surrounding communities that you mentioned that have implemented a growth uh, management ordinance and along with Wyndham, which is new, what, what, what was the commonality in there on the, uh, on the intent, was it uh, number of homes? Did, did any of them segment the type of homes or was there a desired number? What, what was the driving, uh, for lack of a better term, control feature in those ordinances? Because that's typically why we have them. So what were yes. you finding? There, there was a, a set limit on in each town. Um, yeah. yeah, so it's, there's a, you know, and I, I actually include, you know, some of those numbers in, in the report. I can- Okay, great if you want or um there's only i think there's 14 states who actually have passed the growth management act mm -hmm. and you know bob in new england i don't think massachusetts they just use their zoning uh laws as i understand it uh, but yeah that's uh they each have a cap in um in these different towns and it's included in their growth management. right and, and just to follow up did you did you happen to notice each that had the growth management ordinance also had a comprehensive plan I think that my Jay might have to. Uh, I think that maybe requirement. Yes. yes. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So that's a requirement. Yep. Okay. Great. Thank you. Sure. Um, let's see. So I, I was trying to find the, the history and the background of you know how Scarborough came up with it, and I couldn't quite <laughs> get my hands on that and. So I, I, I wasn't quite sure of, you know, who came up with the fractionalized, uh, you know, system for, you know, growth permits. Um, so that kind of eluded me in my you know, research, but I did go on, on the website. I went through all the, you know, past uh, uh, meetings for the long range uh, planning committee. And uh, I was attend in attendance of the last uh, 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 growth I mean, the uh, ordinance uh, committee when we talked about you know, some of these things. So I've been trying to dig deep and find what, what was available to me. Um, yeah, and, and, and if I might just, you know, as Chris, as you're mentioning it, and for those who might be watching or watch this later, I think it's helpful to just sort of um, at least put it in context a little bit that the the idea of the fractionalized units really was an outgrowth of our 2006 comprehensive plan. And a number of the goals and directives that were established in that comprehensive plan, um, and and so that was really the genesis for the start of those type of discussions. Um, okay. Without getting and into great detail you. at this point, but thank you, Jack. <laughs> Any assistance pro hey, provided is appreciated. We do have a question from one of our attendees. Sure. We uh, bear with me here. Chris, why don't you um, continue on, and I'll uh, okay. what it pull in. Interrupt me when you're when you're sure. ready. Yeah. Uh, so next, I moved on to the Scarborough Land Trust. So I was asked to actually do a parking analysis. So I went to all the the conservation sites, um, and I do have a map included at the end of the, the report. Um, so it has the the history and background of the uh, the land trust. Um, like I said, I did go out to all the properties. And um, there's kind of been, uh, well, I talked to Rich Bard, who's the executive director, and you know, kind of compared notes with him and then confirmed 
Um, but there, there's been times, even during the, you know, the, the uh, COVID-19 uh, last few months where some of these sites were getting a little overcrowded and you know, parking issues because people are out enjoying, they're trying to social distance and enjoy the outdoors where it's you know, safer to do that. Um, so in, in talking to Rich, um, he said that the, the land trust is in uh, preliminary discussions um, to add to its land trust portfolio and also uh, add uh, parking spots, some of the locations. He's talking to some of the local, uh, you know, uh, landowners adjacent to some of the properties, and uh, you know, trying to determine where the, the need is the greatest for uh, some parking uh, improvements, um, and also some larger signs. And uh, uh, I think they have a plan uh, for increased uh, visibility and, and larger signs, and some maybe some more signs, it's more. Uh, you know, visible. So I did include in a little chart and it has uh, the year in which the, uh, the land trust site was accessible to the public. And it has a uh, kind of the actual parking spots available, a potential extra like little overflow if possible, and then future need that was identified by Rich Bard. And then the next section is the Scarborough Beach Pass analysis. Um, and I was, I went tried to dig back as, as far as I could. Um, I only got from 2012 to 2019, and unfortunately, uh, 2018 and 2017 are missing. So I, I could not include those in my report. Um, I think one of the things that will you, know, you might want to look at is if uh, to increase revenue uh, is the senior beach pass uh, policy. Um, so 2019, if all the numbers are correct in the chart, there were chunks missing, so I try to do my best. Um, Scarborough distributed 2,582 senior beach passes. And it, that number is steadily increased over the years. Uh, unfortunately, 2016 was the prior year I could compare it to. Um, so it pretty much doubled in you know, a couple of years. And um, that's another you know, issue with uh, the aging population. Um, and I actually did a chart which includes all of uh, uh, the fee schedules for Kennebunk, uh, Kennebunkport, Biddeford, Wells, York, and Ngunkwit. So that pretty much, you, know, you can take a look at that and uh, just compare notes and see what other jurisdictions are doing. We're the, um, we're the Chris, we're the only one who doesn't charge is what I think that's I saw. That's correct. Yes, uh, so the only jurisdiction doesn't charge for seniors. Um, <laughs> Ken's got his thumb up. I, I've got one of those free ones too, but that's okay. <laughs> so my, um, so yes, the even if you charge five to ten dollars, you know it would be about twelve to twenty-five thousand dollars. If you charge uh, the two thousand nineteen rate uh, for uh, like what bidder for charge, which is fifteen dollars, you would raise about almost thirty-nine thousand dollars a year. Okay. And York's rate it was twenty. They they had their seasonal pass at forty dollars a year, and the, the senior pass is twenty, so it's about half. And that, that would have raised about fifty, almost fifty-two thousand uh, dollars, which could you know help contribute to some of the uh, upkeep in facilities and, and staff. But that's just a you know, recommendation something to look at. That's kind of the, the gist of where I'm at. Um, I'm open to. I have about one week left in my internship. I'm happy to you know, update, uh, you know, entertain any thoughts and ideas and work with Jay and, uh, you know, kind of wrap this up. And, and uh, if you have any questions, I'm going to try and answer them. Um, yeah, go ahead, Ken. Great job, Chris. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Matter of fact, if you want, send me an email with a contact because I'd like to give feedback to your professor. On, uh, on a great job I thought you did here. And uh, believe it or not, maybe a town council, they don't need to know me personally. That would be a detraction. <laughs> Might look good on the resume. A great job, thank you. Thank you so much, I appreciate that. Yeah, I would I'd like to echo that. Uh, I thought that it was terrific to have this data in one place and it's great background and context for what we're working on. So thank you. Thank yeah, you. and I will add to that too, Chris. 
Um, did I hear you say you sell houses too? I do. I'm also a real estate broker. Cool. We can talk later. Right. Yes, I am. <laughs> Thought so. <laughs> All right. Um, anything further on this? I think this gives us some good basic data all in one place. It seems to hit on some of the issues that I saw in the long range planning meetings um, that I, I'm sorry, I wasn't able to attend those, but, um, and my, <coughs> excuse me, my assumption, and I know I should never assume is the beach pass and the land trust has to do with some comments that came from folks about impact on natural resources. Is that correct, Chris, Would, or do you know, or Jay, or? Yeah, I think, you know, that's where, that was the direction that we asked Chris to take a look at, because that was something that was raised, certainly, I think, whether it was at an ordinance committee meeting or by a, another counselor, and it was also echoed at long range planning. So it was something we felt that maybe, maybe a point of interest as we move forward. So we might as well uh, use Chris's good work to see what we can unearth. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. And Chris, don't go anywhere. Stay and okay. watch what we're doing. Right. <laughs> it's good for you to observe and you can, you can uh, make comment too if, if you see something. You. All right. Uh, can we go now to Jay? Do you mind filling us in on the long range planning and what came out of there? there? Out of that, there. Sure. Happy to. Um, so I provided a memo and really what I did was I took the same memo that we prepared, Karen and I prepared for the Long Range Planning Committee going into their July meeting, um, where we sort of laid out the five points of interest that were flagged by this committee to the Long Range Planning Committee, and where we tried to provide some background information for them to make a recommendation back to this um, committee. Can we put, I'm sorry to interrupt, can we put that up somewhere for the public? to see. Hey, do you want to, do you want to share your screen or you want me to share the memo? Um, if you have it right there, go ahead. It'll take me just a minute to find it, but um, right. whichever, I'll race you. How's that? Right. Now it looks like you're going to win. So, <laughs> um, so I guess, um, let's see. Um, so I, I guess what I should say, so we, Karen and I, you know, based on the, the memo that uh, Jean Marie sort of, or I'm sorry, the email that Jean Marie put together, which I think um, the other two uh, counselors on the committee saw, sort of asked five, five areas of interest for, for recommendation from the ordinance, uh, from the Long Range Planning Committee. And um, so that's how we tried to capture or put together a memo to help with their, their thoughts. I will say that the ordinance at the long range planning committee meeting uh, committee met twice on these issues um, and still didn't quite get all the way through the memo. So I think they're, you know, this is obviously sort of heady and hard stuff to get your mind wrapped around. And so I'm happy to sort of forge forward, see where we get, see what additional questions are raised as we go. And um, so without further delay, <laughs> I'll sort of jump into really taking the questions really in the same order that they were um, uh, provided for here in this memo. And I'm going to jump sort of by the purpose statement that was really getting the long range planning committee up to speed as to what the ask of the ordinance committee was. But certainly if there's questions along the way, let's stop and do those. Um, because I really think it's helpful to take each one of these and have a discussion around them before we move to the next thing. But I'll, I'll obviously act at the discretion here of the, of the committee. So the first question was about um, how are we doing, you know, our growth. So uh, just by way of background for, again, those who may be watching, I know back in, I believe it was the June ordinance committee meeting, we did an overview of what the growth management ordinance is how we've been tracking with growth. So really building off of that conversation, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time sort of talking backwards on that, unless of course there's questions on that or, or you wish that I do that. Um, the question, the first question was really about how are we doing in terms of our annual allocation? As folks who remember, we have 135 growth permits that are available annually. So come January 1 of each calendar year, automatically there's 135 growth permits that are available. 
the towns are required to every so often take a look at how um, at what those what those numbers look like and potentially adjust the growth how, the annual allocation. So state law essentially requires that um, a town allow for at least 105% or more, a minimum of 105% of the mean number of permits that are issued for new dwelling units um, within a 10 year period. So as you can see, what staff did, we went back and looked at the last 10 years, so 2010 to, uh, to 19, and looked at the total number of permits issued. Um, you're gonna, what we're really gonna focus on is the, the column to the far right. That's the total permits issued. Um, and there's a slight difference between growth permits and total permits issued for the, the reason that we've talked about before and that Ken uh, Johnson had actually highlighted some months ago. The difference is the Hillcrest development, which has, which is, has not been required to obtain growth permits for the for these ten years, um, but where the where the or, where the state statute says for the number of development permits issued, talking with our town attorney, they said that that's both even if there's um, uh, permits that have been issued, uh, building permits that have been issued that didn't require a growth permit, you add those together. So that's that's the that that will be the difference between the um, sort of uh, growth permits and permits issued. We could talk about that a bit more, but um, hopefully that's somewhat of an explanation. So um, essentially over the last, oh, and I, the other thing I need to say is, so you, you do your average of your last 10 years and it's minus affordable housing. And we'll talk about affordable housing in another minute. Um, so you take your average over the last 10 years minus any affordable housing permits that have been issued and so for the town of Scarborough, it's 127 and two thirds of a unit, given our fractional growth permit ability uh, uh, standards. When you do the 105%, um, it gets you to 134 um, growth permits is what we'd minimally be required to have available uh, per state statute. Okay. Uh, Ken, Ken has a question. Hey, I hope you don't mind. Uh, just, I'd like to stay with us. And again, I'm just seeking understanding, not challenging it. Yeah. This, this chart definitely supports what you just said by the state mandate. But the when when the uh, ordinance came, the GMO came into play back in 2001. The initial value was 135. So how was that derived when we didn't have this type of numbers? Do you remember? It's just a it's just a question. So I wasn't in town. Back okay. in, in 01. However, I my understanding of it is there was a bit more of um, how do I say uh, negotiation that went into it. Okay. okay. That's my understanding. That was a good 10 years before I, uh, yeah, maybe five, uh, six, eight uh, years. Rocky and Tom may have, they've got both respond, got their hands up on that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let, I'm going to bring Tom in. Yeah. Tom, can you um, can yeah. hear us? Can you hear me? We can. Yeah. Yeah. I, actually, I think Rocky can give you the most direct experience. He was in the middle of it. And, and all I know is, is what I know from hearsay, but Jay's exactly right. Um, we can probably research and, and put some finer detail to it, but the numbers were initially uh, much lower. And I think the development community and I think Rocky and, and many others that were actively in the development community uh, were involved in that discussion. And uh, there may even have been threatened lawsuits, I don't recall, uh, that motivated. Uh, but in the end, there was a negotiation that came up with that number. Okay. Uh, I'll okay. bring Mr. Rispera into the conversation. Tom, do you want to stay in it? Sure, I'll keep quiet, but I'll stay available. Fair enough. Mr. Rispera, you should be all set. Okay, can you hear me? We can. Yes. Yeah, thank you very much for, for uh, taking my input. Um, I was very much involved back when this all came into play. Um, my recollection, and I could go back to my records, I have a file on it, had it in my hand the other day. My recollection is we could have supported, or, or the town should have been around 180 to 200 units. Um, and if you actually used 105%, it would have been probably two and a quarter-ish. But um, we, we negotiated hard. Uh, 135 was as many as we could get. 
uh, at the time, and uh, and we accepted that. Uh, the development community accepted that at the time because originally it was a three-year deal, and we felt that that was uh, you know we could live with it at the time. Okay. You know, fast forward, it's been 20 years and it's still here. Um, but the short answer is 135 was negotiated. Okay, thanks for Thank the, you. The, yeah. And I'm not sure, quite frankly, and again, I not, don't know if it really helps inform this discussion or not, if that 105% was part of state statute back in 2000, right. 2001, or-, or I don't right. think it was. Right, oh, it was? I, I don't think it was. I'm sorry, I probably shouldn't be jumping in. I'll unmute my, I'll mute myself. <laughs> but again, uh, you know, either way, that's certainly at this point pretty, pretty well in the past and we know what the statute that we have to work with is now, but it is always helpful as Ken to, as you're pointing out, to understand how, how do we get where we are, right? right. Thank you. Yeah. So um, I guess I would just, you know, I think in quick summary, so planning board, long range planning committee looked at these numbers and said, well, if our current number is 134 and the last 10 year average, is, I mean, sorry, our current number is 135 and the last 10 year average is 134, seems like there's not a whole lot to do here. So um, they really have a, we're, um, you know, seem, seem like the 135 number was fine. I should mention, I, and I, I said a moment ago, I was going to circle back to it with the affordable housing bit. And I know there's some discussion last night about affordable housing in general in the town and more specific about a project. But I did mention that this number takes out affordable housing. What the state statute also requires is that a town must allow for a minimum or no less than 10% of the overall number of permits to be available for affordable housing. So if our numbers um, is, is 135, we would have to allow at least the, what, 14 units, if you're rounding up, uh, to be available for affordable housing. The way the town of Scarborough approaches that issue is through our reserve pool. Our reserve pool always holds aside 20 permits for affordable housing. If you remember, we talked about, and actually it'll come up in just a minute here, but um, the reserve pool, you know, the council can add to the reserve pool and then the reserve pool slowly gets drawn down. So if you remember harking back to uh, June, you know, in, in 2017, the council brought the number up to 500. We're down to around 180 left now. If that reserve pool ever gets drawn down to zero and council takes no action to, to add to it, the ordinance has an automatic filler clause that on January 1, the reserve pool gets automatically 20 permits are put into the reserve pool reserved for affordable housing. Um, and that takes no action of council, of anybody. It's written into the ordinance. So that's how the town of Scarborough addresses that issue. And 20 obviously being more than the 14 number, we're well, um, we're above the state minimum requirement. So. Jay, can I ask a question that just popped into my head that I don't know the answer to, or and maybe I should, but I don't. How do we do, what is affordable and how is that determined? So we have our, our definition, which is 80% of the uh, Portland median area income. Um, and so um, that's- So that's, so that's the, the labor statistic area, Portland yep. metropolitan statistical area? Yes, yep. okay. I, I think I got my- That's all right. Wrong there, but- That's okay. I knew <laughs> what you meant. I, I'm glad you understood where I said it. I think Tom has a comment. Yeah, and if I could, it's further broken down by household size. So yeah. uh, the actual um, area median income numbers grow as the household size grows. Right. So a household of one, uh, roughly speaking, is, I, well, I shouldn't even quote it, but I, I can provide that to you if you're interested. Uh, but it, it goes on a graduated scale and increases as the household size increases. The other thing I'd mention, and it was at the front end of Chris's report, the general rule of thumb from affordability is if you're spending more than 30% of your income on housing costs, it's right. not affordable. Right. Uh, so that's the general backdrop. We are for, we're, we're a bit more specific and Jay's exactly right. Um, uh, you know, we make it 80% of the local area median income on top of that. 
And, and my other question, Tom, while I while we've got you, if you mm -hmm. have this is in, or Karen but could pop in here too, is doesn't Scarborough have one of the highest median incomes in this Portland statistical municipal statistical area? Well, that's a blended rate, so I know it, it is. But uh, if you if you broke them out, Scarborough is usually about fifth in the oh, okay. hierarchy. We're okay. behind Falmouth, Cape Elizabeth, okay. Yarmouth, and uh, Cumberland. 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 Cumberland, I know, is the highest. Yeah. yeah okay. We're usually right. about we're usually about fifth, and and we're usually fifth actually on all of the indicators, whether you use median family, okay, household, or per capita. Okay. But purposely, that AMI, that, that statistic is a blended rate for the metropolitan yeah. area. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. All right, Jay. So, yep. I'm sorry. So, so again, uh, I guess I'll just close out annual permits by saying the long range planning committee sort of saying it's stand pat seems to be what the numbers indicate. Um, so that's that's the that's where they came came in with that one. Um, the next question had to do with asking the long range planning committee to really sort of look back at the 2017 decision of council to update the, um, the reserve pool, um, and sort of just understand what happened there. Maybe give some thoughts around that. Um, and so I know I gave you an update back in June about why, you know, what was going on in 2017 when the pool got uh, increased from 215 units to 500. So unless um, you feel necessary, I wasn't going to sort of dive back into the history on that. Other than to say that the Long Range Planning Committee, we did pull out sort of the documents that, you know, were provided to council as part of that consideration part of the documents that were part of the long range planning committee's consideration and initial recommendation to council at the time. And, you know, they basically felt, well, you know, based on the information provided at the time that the decision was made, what the decision was made based on sound information. And that, you know, there's also a recognition that looking at the ordinance, really there's at this point, there's not a whole lot the way the ordinance is written that can be could be done about the 2017 decision um and and for the simple reason that the or, the way the ordinance is written is that it gives council the sole authority to add to the reserve pool which in 2017 based on the information and discussions at the time the council had the will to do and the only way to draw down the reserve pool is by actually allocating the permits. So it's not as though there can be, um, the way the ordinance is written today, there, there isn't a body that could sort of say, well, we're gonna just reduce the reserve pool by a certain amount based on new information. So sort of based on that, the committee said, okay, it seems like the 2017 decision based on, you know, the inf best information available at the time, um, you know, was, you know, there's really, they didn't have much to say about that. However, what they are suggesting is that prior to in, uh, any future discussions around the reserve pool, that those, that we really take a strong look at some of these data sets um, and analysis that, you know, Chris has started and some other data points um, really be part of that conversation. Right now, there are, we have about, I'm trying to remember what the number is. It's somewhere in the order of 180 or 150 permits left in the reserve pool. Um, and, and so, you know, I don't think the, the long range committee felt that there was an immediate need to do anything, but that the information that we gather as part of this process might help inform any future discussions. And really, I think, um, when we get to the next item, when we start talking about fractional units, that's where we sort of listed out what a number of those um, those data sets are. So maybe what I'll do is just wait till we get to that next one, and then we can talk about that a little bit more. Um, Could I just offer a little further context uh, in in and around that 2017 decision? Um, sure, go ahead. 
just very, very quickly, uh, you may recall there, there was a study done in the greater Portland area that identified something in the order of a 4,000 unit deficit of multifamily units. And uh, every developer in the area took note of that. And there was a tremendous interest in trying to meet that demand where it, where it was. And so there was a, a real goal rush, if you will. There were a number of projects uh, kind of in planning phases but one in particular came forward, and that was the Gateway Project up on Haigas Parkway. And that required a contract zone amendment to allow uh, the density that they were seeking. And as part of that approval, um, they asked for and did receive um, you know, uh, an assurance that they would have their growth permits. A, a, a footnote to the multifamily development, unlike any other, certainly unlike single family, the speed with which they build these units and the fact that they build them in 10 and 12 units under one roof really changes the complexion of how to pace, how, how norm normally permits would be paced in the practical course of construction. And case in point, Gateway, you know, in a 24 month period, they've, they've built and have occupied 288 units, whereas single family, that would take you two decades to build out. So that's a real game changer. The final piece I would just add, and I need to verify this through research, but I, I was told that early on, when permits went unused, when we didn't use all the 135, the extra ones went into the reserve pool and, and kind of built up in that reserve pool. That practice had been stopped. And I recall Dan Bacon in the course of this discussion um, doing the math, basically, had that practice been allowed, uh, it was nearly, it, it was close to that 500 number. So it was another way to kind of calibrate um, and arrive at that number. So it's a combination of a tangible project, project that the town desired, which was Gateway, and the realization that had we just simply allowed unused permits to funnel into the reserve pool, we would have been in that range of 500. So I'm not sure if that's helpful, but that's my recollection. So. Thank you. Ken, Ken has had his hand up. Yeah, hey, thanks. Uh, right, I mean, that's growth management through market demands, but that's a different topic. Well, I'll get you right here, Tom. I just want a couple points of clarity. Again, I only seek understanding, but this is live, and Liam, I'm assuming you're recording this, because there's been a couple statements made that I just need to clarify for my understanding. Is, uh, Jay just gave you know a, a very good description on the GMO and the town council authority of being able to add to it to the reserve pool. And the only way to draw that down is to uh, is to actually use the permits within the reserve pool. I just need you know it, it, again that's and that sounds logical. But I just want to make sure that I understand the overriding item there is the authority of the town council. Is that correct? I mean, the town council could could change that ordinance and remove whatever is in that reserve pool, just as a hypothetical. Because again, I'm struggling and I heard Jean Marie at the at the introduction is that the long range, the long range planning committee controls the growth in the town of Scarborough. So this is, it's, it's just not reconciling to me. So I was, going to just ask Tom for uh, clarity. Who does control the growth in the town of Scarborough? Well, the right now, your, your growth management ordinance as written is what controls it, but that's totally within the control of council. You can, okay. you can change it. A long range planning committee uh, doesn't have any role to play other than advisory. In, Thank in you. This. Okay. And it was just clarity. It, it was nothing to hint at intent. I just, I've heard it and, and you know again certain times it's 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 important to clarify some terminology. Thank you very much. Yeah, and Ken, I think the reserve pool is there and, and the council is able to um, replenish it at its will uh, to really add a level of flexibility when there's a project that you want for whatever reason, you have fairly ready ability to make that happen as opposed Correct. to needing to modify the ordinance. Correct. Great. Thank you. And, and I know Don has his hands up, but if I could just flush that out just a little further, talk about um, who has the ability to put their hands on the ordinance, if you will. Um, the, the one piece that we had talked about previously, I just want to mention is 
the long, like Tom just said, the long range planning committee is an advisory group to the council. Ultimately it's council's decision on what it is right. in, the, in the ordinance. But I will say that drawing down of the reserve pool, I just wanna remind folks that the reserve pool is set by council. And then in the ordinance, it says that the planning board through their review process has certain criteria. Projects need to meet a certain criteria. And then if a project meets one of four criteria, the planning board can st still has the, has the ability to allow that project to pull from the reserve pool if they find it meets a, a host of other sort of uh, uh, other sort of provisions that are written into the ordinance. So I do just want to mention that the, the planning board does have a, a have some play here at, in terms of how the allocation the allocation yeah. of those permits. Yeah. Right. And that's what I was getting at. <laughs> and Jay, just a clarification for Ken as well. I think when you said that the council doesn't have the power to remove units, that's under the existing ordinance. In other words, under the rules of the existing ordinance, they're not removed. You would have to amend the ordinance to do that. So that's just a, just a fine line, the clarification yeah. of why um, we said it that way. And again, not suggesting that, I was just yeah. trying to get clarity on right. that. Thank you. Right. Uh, Dawn, are you, are you off video? Because you're not showing up on my screen. Hey, I'm in. Um, no, I, yeah, sorry, I shut, uh, no, I'm still, I'm here. I just shut it off. Do you have a question? Here. Yeah, I did, I, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah, uh, I had a couple questions. Uh, you know, what, I think this this discussion is a good illustration of what's been happening. Uh, you know, in the whole process of us, uh, you know, delving into the detail here of, of the growth management ordinance, it's very complex. There are a lot of moving pieces. We've made some changes along the way. We're we're not totally clear on what the effect has been on all of them. You know, I think some of the the changes. Uh, you know, to increase the reserve pool and to, uh, you know, add permits uh, like we did in 2017. And we haven't talked about fractionalization yet, but those, those things that actions that were taken, uh, you know, you uh, have, have had uh, outcomes and it's not exactly clear, uh, you know, what the effect has been. One, one thing it is clear in my mind that this whole thing is cyclical. Development is cyclical. You know, it follows big swings in the business cycle for both residential and commercial building. Uh, and it's also um, when we've made changes, they've really been demand driven. Okay. They've really been developer driven where, you know, there's been a fear that there would not be enough permitting uh, uh, to allow the construction of developments that um, the you know, uh, builders wanted to, and builders and buyers wanted to support. So, so I, you know, this is a you know, very complicated issue. I know uh, we, you know, are still making our way towards some findings and to try to understand what the levers are that we had. But, but I, I think it's, uh, you know, from our standpoint, uh, and I'll, I'll speak for myself, you know, not necessarily also for, for the council or for Jean Marie or Ken, but there's been a public reaction to the pace of development over the past several years. I think a lot of it is, you know, it's been driven by the downs. I think a lot of it has been driven by the impact that people see in the way of traffic and, and impact on schools, et cetera. So, you know, it's, uh, that's kind of why we're talking about it now. Um, and, um, and I think it is great that we're being very careful and, and, um, uh, steady in our approach and making sure we're studying it carefully before we just, you know, jump ahead to make recommendations that may have uh, unintended consequences. So, you know, I think we're in a good place, but I, th I think it's still not completely clear, that, you know, f you know, what the potential solutions might be. Right. So and I, and I just want to emphasize, uh, and I know I've had this discussion with both uh, Councillor Johnson and Councillor Hamill that, I definitely, this is a process and we are not gonna, in case anyone in the public thinks we're gonna come out of this meeting today with, oh yeah, we're gonna do X, Y, and Z. That's not what's happening. Uh, this is definitely fact finding and getting more information and some of the background and we, I, long range planning has got another meeting September 11th uh, that uh, deals with uh, the questions, <laughs> excuse me that they were, they were given. So I just want to make it very clear to the public that um, we're not going to have, we're not going to have a report out 
um, for a couple months anyway, I would say. So, all right. Thanks, Tom. Uh, there yeah. was a, a, uh, an attendee who had his hand up. I'm not sure if Mr. Rispera wants to chime oh, in. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I Yeah, I can't. I can't. Yeah, that's okay. okay. Uh, Rocky, do you want to put your hand up? Oh, Rocky, you're back on. I'm, I'm back on. I appreciate you. Uh, you you including me. I just wanted to confirm uh, something that Tom had said earlier about the uh, uh, in the original growth management ordinance. Uh, one of the key things that that the uh, developers had fought for and got was the fact that any unused permits would roll over, and that was super important to us <clears throat> because we recognized that the economy would ebb and flow, and and uh, there would be years where uh, permits were not used. And if the town truly simply wanted to average the growth, to, to manage it and, and have it average, uh, there would be no reason why, uh, if permits weren't used, that they would roll over to another year. And so that went that way for quite some time. Uh, and then uh, it got changed, I think, in uh, either 06 or 08. I don't remember uh, when, when they went to the uh, fractional system. But I just wanted to confirm that, that that was very important at the time. And I still think it's important um, because we're going to, you know, we're going to come into times where we're probably the permits don't all get used and uh, they ought to roll over. Thank you. And thank you. Jim, well, can I just, uh, could I just add one more thing? Yeah, go um, ahead. Okay, Don talked about market, um, you know, um, uh, on all different factors, um, engaging why, why sometimes the, um, we've looked at the permitting and I just want to add demographics to that, to that yeah. list as well. Because some things, you know, the market responds to changing demographics. And so just looking at demographics is a root cause of, of why we are looking at alternative uh, types of units as well. Just want to add that to the list. Yep. Um, and also, I would, I would remind folks, um, both here and, and in, the, in the audience, whenever you, people are watching this, that this is why we have an overarching uh, comprehensive plan. This is why you do that because we do have parts i happen to live in the rural part of town where you aren't going to put these huge developments and whatever because of the way the ordinances are written and the the uh, comprehensive plan is but we do have and have identified in town so-called high growth areas um where it makes sense to do infill or development um, and, and I know, you know, in, in my own business in, in real estate, I mean, we've seen housing prices just skyrocket because of lack of inventory. So when you have very restrictive zoning or restrictive non-inclusionary building uh, permitting processes or whatever you want to call it, you're just exacerbating that problem. Uh, and driving people out of your towns and, and, and or out of your state. Um, but anyway, that's my soapbox for today on, on that. So, but this is why we're meeting, so we can come up with uh, what makes sense. Where were we, Jay? I think we had addressed the reserve pool. And I think if we jump into the fractional units, that's where we'll start to really dive into the data, you know, what what additional data sets do we need to help inform the discussion over the next couple of months, as you just said, and sort of, I think what Don was talking a little bit about as well, you know, really trying to understand, you know, we've seen um, some development occur and we have people living under roofs now, so we can really start to take um, account of what's happening. I think last night was a good example. Was that just last night? I think it was um, when, um, uh, as part of, uh, the town's presentation of the, the CEA were able to identify that we anticipated, I think it was, remind me, Karen, 23 students would be coming out of the downs, um, but currently there's only 15 enrolled. Now that could change between now and the start of school, but I, I think we can start to look at developments that have occurred. The Beacon is is pretty well occupied and, and South Village and Eastern Village. So um, we can really start to put some numbers together. So. Um, Speaking of which, um, that's really where fractional units, this issue around fractional units is really where I would say the long range planning committee spent um, a good portion of their time. Don, I know you were at both of those meetings and I, I think um, you hopefully you agree that, that this really seems to be the one where there's a lot of conversation around and, and really 
at this point, it, it, it's about trying to understand are the assumptions we made, you know, back in 2006, seven and eight, when we went to the fractional units and fractional growth permits still valid? Um, can we start to verify those? And, um, you know, what, what are sort of the best, what are the national trends showing? Um, and that's really, again, where Chris's work will start to help inform that discussion. So um, with respect to how to treat fractional units going forward, this is one where the long range planning committee is simply, as I heard it saying, we need more information, we need more time, we need more data. Um, and, and so um, I've started to spell out those type of things that we think might help in that discussion. And certainly we'd love to hear what other elements the ordinance committee members or other counselors as you're having conversations in the next few weeks think would help inform the discussion. Um, Excuse me. So, you know, really we're starting to look at, you know, is there a correlation between the number of cars and bedrooms in a unit? Um, the anticipated trips uh, generated by unit size or type. You know, I think the question is, is it really is a, and maybe I should just pause for just a quick moment because I know there are some folks who, who don't have all the history. When I talk about fractional units in town, we allow our, our density and our growth uh, permits. Um, we have what we call fractional unit sizes. So a unit that is one bedroom or less and 750 square feet or less, and it needs to meet both those criteria, counts as a half a unit. And a unit that has two bedrooms or less and is 1,200 square feet or less counts as two thirds of a unit. Um, I think some of the conversation we have with long range planning committee is, is it bedrooms? Is that really sort of a, a, a good indicator of, um, of impacts or is it unit size? Um, you know, is it two bedrooms and a thousand feet actually should be two thirds? Is it uh, two bedrooms and 2000 feet? I don't know what that is, but starting to think about you know, do those two things have to go together? Or can you, can you, so that's where, when I talk about really understanding, as I just said, anticipated trips by both unit size and unit type, um, that's really sort of what that's, that type of information might inform. Um, student population by, by uh, unit size and type. Um, impacts on public safety and demands for public services. Um, sanitary demands we've talked about, demands on access to the natural resources. Um, and and re again, really sort of looking at national sources, what's happening in the national trends, but also really looking locally where we have these, uh, we have a number of built occupied units in town, both newer and some that are older built in the eighties um, that we could take a look at and sort of see and judge um, and try to, uh, not judge, but analyze, I should say, what those di different impacts are. So um, I really think that's where the committee, again, as I said, spent a lot of time sort of talking about this issue. No clear recommendation at this point in any way, um, really about what more information should we be gathering. And that's what I know Karen and I intend to start, you know, uh, continue, I should say, with Chris's work continue to do um, and pull together to inform this ongoing discussion. Yeah, I'm, I know from what I've heard from other counselors um, and, and from school board too, and some meetings is this whole, it seems to be the lightning rod piece seems to be the two bedroom units, you know, is how many, how are those really impacting schools in, in that case uh, more so than the road uh, road trips or trips whatever you call them um, from from a house or, or or a number of cars it seems to be the impact on schools and uh, is that would that you say that's right Ken and Dawn I mean that's seems to be the the one place is that two bedroom cutoff. Yeah, I think that's, uh, yeah, seems to be the, you know, a question mark. Uh, you know, I think the fractionalization, uh, you know, is, is also confusing because we talk about units, then we talk about permits, and we talk about, yeah. you know, square footage, and, you know, it, so, you know, and a half a unit, you know, what do you do with the rounding on half units and point, you yeah. know, 
point six six seven you you know units. I mean, what you know does it round up or round down? So I mean, I think that just the terminology is a little confusing. Uh, we talk you know about dwelling units. We talk about permits. We talk about growth permits. Um, you know, it, it it's it is kind of confusing to know. Ken, you go ahead, Ken. Yeah, I, you know, just a comment. I, I think the, the long-range planning did a great job. I watched both the meetings. Pretty pretty impressive. Very smart folks. And I saw how they struggled with <laughs> with the fractionalization, which, which yeah. kind of says something, you know, by itself. But uh, I don't know about you, but after a long day's work, uh, I, I don't go to work, my unit. I go home. So anyway, <laughs> carry on. <laughs> All right, Jay. Anything else? Um, you know, I, I don't have anything else at this point. As I said, I think you know my memo, uh, my our memo. <laughs> we laid out what um, some data points that we're going to continue to explore. So um, we're happy to sort of continue that conversation here, or maybe you need you know have some more time to think about it and send emails along. Um, I think mm -hmm. Karen and I will be working, as I said, over the, you know, over the next course of several, mm -hmm. you know, weeks and months to, to try to pull stuff together. So um, what, really, what's the focus of the September 11th meeting? I should know that. I, but I yeah, haven't so, read yeah, that yet. In fairness, Jean Marie, we haven't sent the agenda out yet. Oh, so okay, fairness, good. It's not, that's not, a, actually, we're, we're going to pivot away from growth management for right now. Um, okay. Because the, um, we have a couple other things that are, are right. um, need, need some consideration um okay. there's some so uh so yeah it, i would say we're going to pivot away for, from growth management okay. for for the short term okay uh, but i think the long range long range planning committee stands ready to to continue the conversation okay um, great. there was mentioned I, I should say um you know we we're talking a little bit about next steps i know there's a couple but one of the things the long range planning committee did talk about is potentially you know at some point conducting a workshop either with, with this council, with this committee or the entire council, but also engaging obviously the stakeholders. We see Rocky yes. uh, Risbera has yes. been part of this conversation, but there's clearly others, um, both in the development community and citizens at large, <laughs> um, yeah. whatever, whatever business they're in, who probably want to be part of this conversation. So there have yeah. been some we, you know, the long range planning committee didn't come up with sort of a, a, a game plan moving forward yet, but just sort of said, hey, we let's, you know, I, I think, as I've already heard here with you folks, we understand that this is going to be an ongoing discussion right. and that, you know, there's no immediate, um, sounds like what I'm hearing anyway, so there's probably right. not going to be any immediate changes, but. Right. Um, Mr. Hamill. Yeah, so I'd, I'd just like to, you know, thank Jay, uh, uh, you know, for his work and the work of the Long Range Planning Committee. They have been very deliberate and very thoughtful. And I, and, and I think the, you know, the emphasis that Jay and team had put on, you know, being fact-based. I know I've heard Rocky, you know, uh, underline this as well, the need for us to verify what's what the numbers are and compare those to the assumptions or at least even our projections, you know, and then, and then decide what we need to do rather than jumping ahead you know, we're assuming we know what the data is because we've seen already we were wrong on our assumptions on enrollment so far. You know, that last bit of data shows they, you know, they are trending, enrollment figures are trending lower than anticipated. I think there are other things that are gonna be happening that may, you know, have a different impact on the numbers. So I think that, you know, I would just to, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, applaud and reinforce the need to be s deliberate and steady and, and careful you know, as we move forward on our analysis. I know public wants did something done yesterday, but we're, you know, I think it's going to be important. We take the time to decide what, you know, the real controlling factors are and then focus on those. Okay. Ken. Yeah. I, I want to thank you too, Jay. I know you've done a lot of hard work. You, Karen, LRPC, everybody really, really definitely appreciate it. Uh, but back to the stakeholders, just to get some input from you. I do believe this uh, committee does plan on engaging with the developers. Yep. I don't know what form yet. I think we're going to have that discussion after this, after the, this session right here. Uh, for for who we would classify as a developer, of course, Mr. Risbera and uh, okay. and Mr. Mishu, and they actually, I think, last night definitely uh, hinted that they they were interested in the discussion. I was thinking also uh, uh, maybe Carrie Anderson, yep. another master planner developer. 
maybe uh, I can't Elliot Chain. Elliot. Yep. Uh, who are the other, for lack of a better term, you know, players, developers, not the one-offs? I, I, I didn't know about the gentleman down here on the Cottage Road. I think I had sent you an email. Mm -hmm. Maybe I, I could have a discussion with him, but I was going to get some advice from you first. Is is he a one-off with just a big project, or do you think he'll he'll be around for a while? Plus, his project will be going for a while, correct? That's probably a two-year, two or three-year project. So yeah, I, um, I think uh, the uh, Mr. O'Leary certainly has O'Leary. another profession, um, and that uh, he's owned this one property for quite a while and has really targeted this one. So. Um, I think that's a fair characterization of what my expectation would be going forward is that he'll be fairly focused on that one project. Okay. I could, you know, who, future is always uncertain, but that, that right. seems like a fair characterization, but um, certainly staff could put together a, a list of folks and, and it, again, of course, we'll, you know, we'll do the, the appropriate notifications and maybe even as we understand our timing, do a Facebook post or, you yeah. know, really try to advertise because I think, I think we do like always want to try to cast a wide, as wide a net as we can, but certainly I think this type of conversation has the greatest impacts on those that, as you were just representing, are, are those developers that are okay. in the large projects that are doing multiple things where, you know, if I'm just building a single family home, for the most part, I'm going to be able to get my growth permit and, right. <laughs> and be happy, I think. Yeah. Right. All right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so where do we go from here? So there were actually two two other things that oh okay sorry weighed in on so if we're good with fractional units for now yeah sorry sorry no, that's yeah, quite can a I just stop you for a sec uh, Tom Tom has his hand yeah. up I think he wants to contribute something I, I just want to make one comment kind of as you wrap up fractional the fractionalization um, you know there's a lot of mystery around this as to why it came to be in the first place in fact uh, I think some might even kind of demonize it that it's kind of a scheme. Um, Keep in mind that your 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 touch point is always your comprehensive plan that articulates these yeah. broad themes, these aspirational goals, and the manifestation of that is through your land use, through your zoning, in this case, uh, growth management certainly, and in particular, the growth management ordinance. These most recent changes in that 06 to 08 range. Um, we're really advancing some of the key priorities uh, identified very clearly in the 06 comp plan, those being um, encouraging diversity, uh, housing diversity and, and increasing density. Uh, they, these were very particular strategies to advance those very uh, direct themes from the comp plan. So they, they didn't come out of the ether. Um, they were very deliberate uh, as a way to going outside going beyond that okay okay thank you yeah. and just a point of fact um though it appears as though we may be the only main community i think it is a, a fairly common practice elsewhere in the country so it's not right. i just wanted to put it in context yeah thank you so i guess what i'll do is now uh the other question uh there were really two more questions that the ordinance committee asked um uh long rangers to weigh in on <laughs> and one of those, the next one was really about the allocation of permits by project. And, you know, it seemed to be the question of, you know, um, one development sort of being able to phase out, if you will, and being able to, again, I'll step back for just a quick moment. Through our annual allocation, there's a provision that says 
um, anyone, anyone, one, any project is only eligible for upwards of 20% of the annual allocation. That would be 27 growth permits. Um, and so there was some question about some of the larger projects we have in town, such as Dunstan, Eastern, and the Downs. Um, we'll have multiple subdivisions because they're, they're projects of such a different scale that they'll have multiple subdivisions. And therefore, I think, you know, I'll just use the Downs. Rocky's here to, if, to correct me where I go wrong. You know, there was some 135 units plus or minus built within the last year and a half, or as we all saw, go up pretty quickly. Um, uh, it, and those, but there were different subdivisions. So the single family component was one subdivision. The, uh, the first batch of multifamily and duplexes that you see on the right hand side coming off route one was another subdivision. The next batch of multifamily, which are rentals are, was another subdivision. So they're able to sort of parse that out and then, uh, be able to um, uh, secure the tw upwards of 20% for each subdivision. The Long Range Planning Committee sort of talked about this issue and really sort of thought about it in, in terms of a common scheme, right? If we call the Downs a common scheme or Eastern Village a common scheme of development, you know, is that is that an issue? Um, it, really the conversation centered around, well, boy, it, it seems technically feasible that one subdivision could potentially have five different sub, uh, one common scheme, let me say, could have five separate subdivisions in there and come in for 20% on all five of those and secure all the permits. I think the Long Range Planning Committee talked a bit about that and based on the history we have, almost 20 year history of the growth management ordinance, never really seen anything come close to looking like that. Um, the committee felt, you know, while technically a possibility, it seems very unlikely. Um, so I think their, their recommendation, I'm just sort of looking at this. Um, so after discussion, the consensus was the committee didn't have any, um, any issues with the town's current provisions on this point. So I think that, that was sort of where they wound up after some discussion. And Jay and maybe Rocky can weigh in on this too. My assumption, and again, I'm using that word, you gotta be careful, is that when you pull a permit, you've got, what is it, six months to complete it? Right. And then you, yeah. and then you get into a building permit. Oh, into a building permit, okay. Correct. And then you because have a year to get your, I think it's, a, it's either a year or six months to get started on the building permit. Yeah, I think it's yeah. the shorter of the two. I think it is too, yeah. But, but, the, but my point being that if I'm a developer and I'm doing particularly single family, you don't build 50 of them all at once because of the cost factor. And am I right, Rocky? I mean, and that would kind of help. It's sort of self-regulating. And, and before Rocky, and I, speaking, yeah. I, I think in terms of the single family, certainly, I think we have a, a, a very good example happening in town right now. Because um, I think the projects we just talked about, Eastern, Dunstan, Downs, are a mix of uses. I yeah. think Leighton Farm is a really good example. That's the subdivision that's off oh, Elmwood. Right. has right. 99, 99 lots in it. It was approved back in gosh, if I had to guess, I'm going to say 2014, 2015. Yeah. And they're, you know, probably two thirds of the way built out. So I think for single family development, you're, 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 you know, that seems to be the pace that we see. Yeah. Can yeah. we go to Rocky first, Ken, yeah. do you mind? And then we'll go to Ken. Remind me, Ken. Go ahead, Rocky. Okay. Uh, um, yeah, I'm not on mute. Uh, I just wanted to say that you, Jay gave a pretty good explanation there, but one thing that I think got left out that you have to think about, especially in the Downs uh, instance, Often the development entity, the, the, the person, who, you know, the, the development company that's actually building those projects are different. Yeah. Um, it's not always Crossroads Holdings that's, that's right. doing everything at the Downs. And I think that that's, that actually happens uh, maybe a lot more than people uh, yeah. might, might realize. But if you think about the Downs, there are many different developers in there actually doing the project. Uh, that's, that's a good point. I had forgotten that. Thank you. 
And, and do keep in mind, uh, as Jay mentioned earlier, there's also the ability for certain projects, affordable housing, for instance, and also those approved through a contract zone like Gateway that are allowed to dip into the pool, those aren't counted in that calculation. They have a kind of an automatic pass, if you will, to be able to um, get growth permits uh, in a separate process. Well, th this this topic sounds like it's something that definitely, if we doing a round table or a workshop with some developers, we could get some more input to. Ken, you had your hand up. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I could talk about this one all day long, but I'm not gonna because I, <laughs> I, I did watch the, uh, the the long range in this topic, and I really, I, I really think something got lost there. I don't think anybody was ever concerned that a full develop one developer would would suck up all the permits. Got to remember this ordinance came into play long before the master plan concept, which I don't still want to understand how this master plan came in where you could have multiple subdivisions. You have to look at it. This is the way I look at it is the 20% was just another way to manage growth. Okay. The pace of growth. That's what the intent was. And it was a fair sharing across developers. I don't think anywhere anybody's ever thought that a single developer would be consuming all, all, all the permits. However, it does have some, some, some impacts. Now, we've not had this with uh, Risbera and the Downs, but I've had to do a site walk with another Remain Nameless master plan development that doesn't have the resources that a Risbera has that was jumping from subdivision to subdivision before finishing subdivision A, moving assets over to subdivision B, and all of a sudden we had performance problems. So again, it's all wrapped in, it's a bigger picture than, again, I, I sense lots of folks think that we should be managing our growth by market demand. And that's not what the intent of that ordinance was. And that's not what I generally feel, but anyway, Thanks again for my for allowing me to give input. <laughs> <laughs> Don, Don. Thank you. I wanted to build on something that uh, Ken just mentioned. You know that this subdivision, um, you know, individual division uh, question. So it's it goes deeper than just the the matter of you know who's pulling permits. Because even though you know we heard Rocky say that there are many developers in the downs, yes, that's true. But there are still you know uh, other financial uh, relationships you know uh, between and among developers, and you know like uh, you know somebody might be selling the land and holding a percentage of an entity that's developing you know something within the master plan. So so you know it's not just a matter of. Uh, permit allocation it's also a matter of you know what what financial interests are involved uh you know there so i mean that's not and that not necessarily something the town can control or try to manage but i think it's just something to help us understand you know what's really driving the development and you know where interests uh you know may may be aligned in terms of uh, the demand side of the equation mm -hmm. i mean i just use an example from the update last night uh you know, there. This is the first year's review of the downs. Uh, 138 uh, units are completed to date, with another almost 550 on the horizon in the next. Uh, uh, you know, in the next five years, I guess it is, uh, or the next three years, and 80 percent of those are are slated to be uh, senior assisted uh, living, uh, you know, multifamily and condos. So, I mean, that's there's there's big implications to just that one that one development and th that activity within, you know, within that one place. So um, I just, something for us, us to keep in mind as well in terms of, you know, when we're trying to evaluate what the impact is and, you know, what, who's, whose interests are involved and what's driving the ultimate outcome mm -hmm. here on a, any revisions. Mm -hmm. and, and I see just the discussion we're having right now uh, speaks to our need to really analyze what we've got, talk to the different stakeholders, make sure we are hearing from people who are concerned and that, you know what their concerns are, because there's that balance there. And I know I've heard this, well, we can't just have it market driven, um, but that's one element of it. And you gotta have that balance between the right to develop, you know, private property rights, yep. as well as, you know, 
what are the needs of the of the community which brings me back to where are we with this comprehensive plan jay i'm putting you right on the spot with that one i know because yeah. that i see that as we got in we need that because that's kind of the again the overarching either the overarching or, or the underpinning however you want to put it for the yeah i i couldn't agree more <laughs> um and it's certainly something that you know I, I think karen and i and tom have talked about would really like to get back sort of in the in the eye yeah. if you will yeah. if you'll recall back on it was march 6th the long-range <laughs> planning committee uh, moved the the current draft out of committee and and said they were satisfied with it and and we're coming up with a plan of where to go next we're going to try to get together with council to say okay I want to spark the interest of the public, start thinking about it, maybe where to go to start reading it, and position it quite well, and then I think uh, the council has got to, you know, we, we, we got to start addressing it. So we've just been a little busy because of COVID, but uh, it, it's definitely an important thing that we all want to get involved, so. Yeah. Jim Marie, I think what we're all saying is we're ready when you guys are ready. Yeah, I mean, and um, we have the vice chair of the council sitting here, Mr. Hamill. Yes. Just something to put on that agenda, maybe to look at. We we do need to get this comprehensive plan out there, particularly where we're talking about growth and man growth management, because yep. they go hand yep. in hand. So. And, and Don, before you start, start, because because she's pressing you for an answer. Just give it a thought, because I think a workshop just to familiarize the council yeah. with it. And to actually, because I'm, I'm very interested in seeing the delta from the 06 to the 220. Yeah. So yeah. things like that, to just get the energy going in the conversation, get everybody grounded and whatnot. Yeah, yeah there's no question that we need to bring that back, uh, you know, onto the screen for people and we'll get it in the queue. And it does drive, it's a, you know, it's an umbrella document that covers a lot of things. So the one thing, I, a couple caveats though, it is a very broad document. Even yeah. the original one was at a principal level, is very broad, uh, and there's a lot of room for interpretation. It does give a lot of latitude uh, to how, you know, how to reconcile things with the plan, number one. Number two, the update was, you know, the original plan was very comprehensive, it had a lot of standing committees, went on for months, the revision to the plan was, uh, you know, a, a smaller, uh, you know, effort. So we want to make sure we're we're not losing anything from the original plan, um, you know, in our update of the of the new one. So um, so anyway, those just a couple of issues. Yeah. yeah, I just don't want us to lose the thread of that, just because exactly I don't want right. to get, as you like to say, Don, get ahead of our skis or the tips of our skis, whatever it is that saying. Yeah. Yeah, it's seasonally in inappropriate, but yeah. I you're know, right. but no. <laughs> water skis. Water skis. Okay, water skis. Jay, okay. <laughs> right. Jay, are, is there anything else? Yeah, the last, the last item was yeah. the discussion on moratorium, and actually, I think that was uh, maybe Jean Marie. You even mentioned that earlier. So, um, based on based on what the long range planning committee has seen, what the state statute language is around, uh, you know, the the sort of two provisions for why you might enact a moratorium, the Long Range Planning Committee didn't feel that um, that was perhaps a necessary tool at this time. Right. Um, I'll just keep it that brief since uh, I know we're getting- And that's fine. That word just came up with some other counselors, so that's why we included it in mm -hmm. our discussion with Long Range Planning. 
I, I would just mention that number one there um, is something to keep in mind in terms of what the goal of the growth management orders might be. You know, so the, the first and I presume primary reason to enact a moratorium is to prevent a shortage or, or overburden of public facilities. Yeah. To me, that's understanding impact and in that that's a, that has a negative connotation. And so I think that's a key thing. And, and I was very pleased to hear that uh, we've got some good thoughts underway to, to surround ourselves with data so we can understand impacts. And I think that's a real key ingredient or component of the growth management ordinance in my mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I agree. All right, where do we go from here, guys? Now I'm gonna focus on my fellow members, Mr. Hamill and Mr. Johnson. What, would, what, what, you, what you're thinking? Just next steps. Engage yep. maybe the next uh, set of uh, stakeholders, possibly the developers. I'm not. I'm not sure. We could okay. brainstorm. I don't know if we need to decide right now or. But still, I think our information gathering uh, venture is not over. No, no, right. not by a long shot, Don. Right. Yeah, I and I, I agree with Ken uh, on his comment. I'd, I'll add the, a couple of things. Uh, we, we touched on comprehensive plans, so let's make sure we try to get that uh, at least in some general timing and sequence yep. uh, for the next several months, uh, number one. Number two, I would say that we, we do have a couple of pieces of work we're waiting for the long range oh. long rangers to come back to us on, so I'd like yeah. us to, you know, to make time for that, um, recognizing they do have other fish to fry, not just uh, answering our memo there of a month or two ago. So, right. Jay, do you have an idea? Give us an idea on this. Maybe it's not a September timing; it's an October timing. Right. You know, for because uh, I'm what I'm. What I think Jean Marie is asking is when when can we get those missing pieces of data so we can come around as a committee uh, yeah. with recommendations for the council, you know, in a workshop or something more definitive if that's possible. Yeah, I, I would think um, I would think we should be able to provide some more information for this committee and Long Rangers come October. I know my understanding, talking with Jean Marie, that we still have this committee has five G on its radar. Yeah. I think that yep. maybe That's September. Yeah, I think that might be next up, and I know I need to now pivot my attention to that because <laughs> yep. and remember yep. what the heck I was doing with that a month <laughs> ago. So. Right. Um, so yeah, I would think you know we're we're probably you know we're a month and a half away from having some from uh, continuing this conversation or so. Yep. But we, Jim, we, we might consider as uh, preliminary recommendations, or here's what we know now, yeah. and here's what's missing, and then we give provide a timing, you know, yeah. on that. So we're resetting expectations. Yeah. We made a headway. We learned some new things. We're yeah. validating data uh, yeah. to verify perceptions you know, uh, separate perceptions from reality and, you know, or combine them and, yeah. and then, you know, then we'll be ready. So. Cause our next ordinance meeting would be October 22nd. If on the regularly scheduled, um, I was just looking at my calendar. You don't which mean may, September? Excuse me. You said October. You do. You mean oh, I'm sorry. October, October 22nd. September is, is 5G and that's the oh, okay. that date yeah, is. I'm I, sorry. I guess that's what I, you know, it's been a long day. It was a long yeah. night last yeah. night, too. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess just as part of this conversation, yeah. I, I, I do want to be, you know, I guess I don't want to overcommit because I, I do think it is important for us to really talk about how we, where, which, how are we going to integrate the comp plan with this discussion? Yeah. Um, you know, so it may... I, I guess that we need to have an ongoing discussion, maybe, you know, yeah. well, I don't know if now is necessarily the time, but with the, uh, you know, uh, council chair, Tom, you know, yeah. okay. vice chair, That's fine. figure out really what, what are the priorities? Because we do have, as Don said, the comprehensive plan is, it's all yeah. encompassing. I mean, we think uh, right. growth management is difficult. That's just talking about the pace of development. Right. <laughs> you know, the comp plan talks about, not just development, it, it talks about everything in the community. So I think, um, yeah, I, I just want to be, you know. Well, and the reason I throw out October 22nd is not so much to say we're definitely, you know, we may have a bullet on this, but to at least reserve some time for October or have that as a, as a, um, um, a goal date for having some of this in 
Does that make sense to Dawn and Ken? Yeah, in the least preliminary recommendations. Yeah. 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 So, you know, I mean, the distinction status. with the, sorry, go ahead, Ken. No, no, like a status before, at least we're, you know, yeah. Yeah. Status. we're moving forward. Right. 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 Yeah, 5G is uh, not to get in the weeds here, but 5, 5G, we're going to be coming back, I think, in September with with proposed ordinance language, you know, yeah. uh, for us to, you know, right. to finalize. So that that is farther along. You know, yeah. uh, I'm not going to say it's less complex as of an issue. No. You know. <laughs> so but it is farther along. No. Well, and that's yeah, that's a whole different ball of wax. I mean, this is a huge yep. ball of wax when you're yep. talking about growth of a town the size of Scarborough. So, yep. Yep. All right. Um, so let's, let's do this. I will, I will come up with some sort of a report back to the council on what we're doing, if that's okay. And I'll run it by you too, Ken and Dawn. Great. Um, so that you can look at it and add or subtract from whatever I write. I'll get Great. that done in the next week. Um, See, I have, to, I have to set homework for myself or it doesn't get done. <laughs> it, it, you know, it goes from my 20%, you know, the Pareto principle, 20% and then 80%. It doesn't make my 20% if I don't put it there. Um, and um, we will tentatively um, shoot for at least some type of discussion on the 22nd of October, follow up. In the meantime, Dawn's going to talk to the Mr. Ham uh, what's his name? You're Mr. Hamill. The Mr. other Johnson. Mr. Johnson, Chair Johnson, about something with comp plan, workshop yeah. something yeah. with the council. An the ETA, ETA, yeah, estimated yeah. time of arrival. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and we will start weaving this stuff together. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Yes. All right. Anything else? I hope not, because I'll kill anybody. No, 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 no. Oh, thank everybody. Thank, thank you. No, everybody. thank you all. This is awesome work. I know that everyone has a lot on their plate. Chris, thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed your time in Scarborough. Um, Send me that email, Chris. I know, really. Send me that contact. I will do really? that. Yes. Really, really. That, that's that's great. Um, Tom or Rocky, anything? Are we good? You can just nod. I can't see you. You look good. Okay. Tom? No? Okay. Can I have a motion for... Oh, Ken, you waving? No, I was waving oh. about to log off. I'm sorry. <laughs> we have to adjourn. We have to adjourn officially. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So, so moved. <laughs> second. In second. Okay. Uh, we do have to take a formal vote on that, Mr. Johnson. Yes. Mr. Hamill. Yes. Ms. Katarina says yes. And uh, we're all done. 5.44 p.m. That was great. Good meeting. <laughs>